Thanks for checking out this review video for Game of Thrones Season 8, Episode 1. Uh, I feel like I barely even heard about this show. Yeah, right. It's pretty much all anyone's talking about. So, just so everyone knows up front, if you're watching this video and you have not seen Game of Thrones or you're not caught up to Season 8, do not watch any further. Stop. Go watch the entire show, up, including Season 1, or uh, Season 8, Episode 1. Then come back to this video, because I am going to spoil it's all spoil. So this is basically a uh, kind of a reaction, kind of a review for me. I watched uh, season eight, episode one, and as I was watching, I wrote down a bunch of notes, which I will go over in this video. So sorry, I will be looking down in order to do that. If people like this enough, I will continue to do these reviews for the entirety of season eight. So with that said, let's get into it. Oh, also, subscribe, please. If you like this video, if you like any videos you've seen on my channel, subscribe. And you can check out those other videos. Anyway, so uh, the first thing when I started watching it, you know, I, I pop it on because I watched it on demand. I didn't watch it when it actually showed Sunday night. I know. <gasps> Blasphemy. Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you watch it with everyone else? It's because I happened to be off today and I was very tired last night. And I was just like, I'll just watch it first thing in the morning with some coffee because that's a good way to do it. I'm sure some people had it with mead the night before. Hopefully everyone enjoyed it. But anyway, uh, the first thing I saw was the runtime on this, and I was like, weren't we promised like two hour long episodes or something for this season? So then I kind of did a little bit of research, and apparently what was put out is that, <clears throat> excuse me, allergies and stuff, is that the episodes weren't necessarily going to be an hour. Some will be an hour, some will be over an hour, so they had run times broken down, and the longest any episode is for the season is an hour and 20 minutes, which I believe the last two episodes, it's only six episodes, episodes five and six are going to be an hour and 20 minutes each, but there are a few other ones that go a little bit over an hour, Some there's one that's like a little bit under, so it varies, but I was going in expecting, I'm like, here we go, two hours of Game of Thrones. No, so I was a little let down, but that may have just been my fault. Oh, by the way, yes, these are the sigils on the shirt. My wife got me this shirt some years ago from like Redbubble. You know, they would do a lot of shirts on there. Worth it. Okay, so digging into what I actually saw. When uh, they're in Winterfell and Jon Snow and Daenerys and everyone's coming in, I was like, why didn't Arya talk to Jon Snow then? But I, I believe what was going on there is... It's just been so much time and she was so overtaken by emotion that she was kind of like, like kind of frozen. Like she didn't know what to do. She basically let that kind of quick moment pass where it would be appropriate for her to run up to him and talk to him because she hesitated on it. She's like, what do I say to him? It's been so long, you know, just kind of shocked by seeing him after so long. So at first I was like, go, like, I'm sure a lot of you were like, go talk to him. You love him. Like, he's your favorite person in the world, basically. But that ends up getting taken care of much later when he's at the, um, what, whatever that tree is, like the weeping tree or something like that. Um, the old gods. Uh, and he, um, he has a really good, you know, time with t talking with Arya. You know, they show each other their swords. They're like, hey, check out my sword. Hey, check out my sword. And, uh, no, it's like a really nice, sweet connection. And I think that's something that people have been kind of waiting for for some time now. So I thought about that. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Right after she sees Jon Snow, then she sees the Hound. And that moment for me, like I'm sure a lot of you people watching this was like, oh, man, this is something. There, there's a lot of gravity. There's a lot of weight in that moment where you feel what Arya feels, you you know she's like, I can't believe that dude's still alive. I don't have to kill that guy. I don't have to kill that guy. So then when they meet each other later, he she literally uh, just pokes at him, basically. And, and kind of, I, I don't know if she's kind of saying, like, I, I will kill you again, or just saying, I don't, I would rather that you have been dead. Like, I don't care about you at all, basically. Because when he says to her, um, you know, you left me for dead. And she's like, well, I, I robbed you first. <laughs> Which, that's great writing. The, that's a wonderful line. I think that was actually, like, my favorite exchange in that entire episode, to be honest. Like, it's such, like, a, ooh, he got you. Or she got him in that instance. You're like, hmm, okay. 
it's it is like that and you can understand it i mean he's on the list come on you guys he's on aria's list along with a bunch of other people who are still alive uh all right so i will say though something that hit me when the procession was coming into winterfell like how regal how regal and like powerful did Daenerys look when she was coming in like the way she was positioned on the horse and like her face she was kind of like you know what I mean I don't even know if I'm doing it close to right but I just felt like I was like she she looks like she is a queen like she totally looks like it and she looks like she's demanding the respect she deserves the, all the respect and then when the dragons come in and people are just like <gasps> I mean it's a cool moment at first I started to feel like oh they're really kind of like making this a little bit like filler wise they're just starting things slow but i also kind of feel like they were starting it that way and starting it kind of slow because they had just run the recap of you know previously on game of thrones and i think it was good because that that slow start allowed people to kind of catch up and start processing things in their head because they don't have everything in that recap so you know when they give you the recap certain things you see will then make you start thinking okay well then there was also this and then now i'm remembering this so that was kind of giving people mental time to get like prepared for the actual episode so i actually thought it was a good idea and it ended up working um uh, you can tell the the first meeting between daenerys and sansa you can tell that sansa is does not like giving up any sort of power I mean, first of all, there's the issue of she doesn't trust anyone. And that becomes very obvious in this episode that she just does not trust people. And that's totally understandable because if you really think about it, a lot of times people are, are most shaped by their worst relationships in life, especially if they're relationships they have to endure for a lot of time. And think about her, you know, longtime relationships that were terrible. And these are the people who shaped her, Cersei, basically, and um, Littlefinger. So she has just been surrounded by, I don't want to say evil, but like unbridled meanness and cunning and just people who will never tell you the truth. So throughout this entire episode, she's very wary of Daenerys. She's very, she seems very wary of like everyone pretty much. And you kind of can't fault her because that's the place she's coming from. That's kind of all she's known and that has gotten her to where she is right now as the Lady of Winterfell. And, I mean, it's sad and it's messed up, but at the same time, like, you look at it in the show and you're just like, come on, like, get your head straight. You have to trust somebody. Like, you, these people are good and these people are not good. And be able to make that separation in your mind and, like, be cool to these people and don't be cool to these people. But um, it's within the context of the show. It's their real life. And in real life, things are super messy. And if you are Sansa, if you're that person, it's hard to figure those things out. It really is. Like, how do you know for sure? As the viewers, we know, because we see the whole story, she doesn't know everything. So that's why it becomes so frustrating for us audience members or just like, oh, my God. We're, we, like, want to yell through the TV and tell her what she needs to be doing and thinking and saying. But you can't. And that's kind of one of the best things because amazing writing for shows and movies is making you feel things. Specifically making you feel things you don't want to feel. When you get frustrated at a show... That's because, well, when you get frustrated because the writing's good, that's how you know it's really well done. Not frustrated like watching Iron Fist frustrated because that's a whole different thing. But anyway, um, uh, I thought it was great how they pretty much immediately bring up the issue of resources. How they bring all these people in Daenerys and all her people, you know, the Unsullied and the, um, the Throcky and, you know, all these people. And they're like... We don't really have the resources for this. Uh, we're running very, very low as is. And then they introduce the issue of the dragons. The dragons have to eat, and they're running low on their food. What do they say, like cows and sheep or something that they were feasting on? And it's getting low. And that's, that's great because you're showing that it's a dire situation and that there's potential for conflict amongst the people there who have a shared... Um, goal, you know, that can happen. Like, it, it can put them at odds because a huge thing is, like, when resources become scarce, people don't act rationally. And you can forget about, like, people trusting each other in alliances and stuff like that. 
So I like the fact that they injected that into it. It's very real life. There are a lot of shows that they would just ignore that because it becomes too messy for their writing. So I love that they actually included that. It makes a lot of sense and it makes it real. Um, uh, yeah, and then I just kind of wrote about Sansa being so warped. Um, so then we go to the portion where we're, where we're seeing Yara with Euron. And I felt like at that moment, and it ended up happening, because she was alive, I was like, they're definitely setting this up for Theon to redeem himself and come and save her. And I didn't think it would be the same episode, but it ended up being the same episode where he shows up, he you know kicks some butt, and then he lets her loose. She headbutts him, <laughs> and then holds her hand out to him, which makes sense because it's kind of like, hey, you wimped out and, and left me for dead the first time, but then you came and saved me, so... I'm going to hurt you, and then we're good. <laughs> As kind of like, now we're even. Which, it made sense, and I, and I thought it definitely fit Yara's character. Definitely. Which, by the way, I believe that her name is Asher in the books. I have I have gone through the books, and I believe her name's Asher in the books. Which I think is a better name than Yara, but it doesn't really matter that much, does it? Uh, so, okay. Then we then we end up getting to the, the stuff with Euron and Cersei, and like... It's funny because you see how disgusted Cersei actually is with Euron, but she needs him so badly that she has to be very calculated with the way she interacts with him because she's like, God, I hate this person and I just want to tell him off. Probably want to just execute him, to be honest. But I, I need so much from him, so I need to figure out how to give him just enough to keep him helping me and not give him too much, like not sleep with him. But with their interaction in this, she had to sleep with him because he, he basically alluded to the fact that there, was, there were cracks starting in, in him, in, in his loyalty. And that if she doesn't do the certain thing that he was looking for, which is having sex with the queen, um, he was going to, he, you know, was, was not truly faithful. Like you got that feeling in the, in the actor's acting that he would contemplate defecting, that Either he would do things for himself or he would turn to the other side. So you see that moment where she just it just kind of clicks in her head. Like she was fighting it, but then she's just like, I guess I gotta sleep with this annoying, awful, disgusting individual. Hope he doesn't have barnacles on his you know what. We'll find out. And then he all he wants to do after they are are done with Coitus is talk about how he was. Like how did I compare to uh, the to Baratheon, huh? That dumb drunk. How did I compare to your brother? Because, yeah, I know about that. <laughs> it's just like, I wouldn't say I feel sorry for Cersei at that moment, but I can taste the awkwardness in the air at that point. And I'm just like, uh And it's obvious that she lies to him about everything she says. She's like, oh, I like that you're so arrogant. But he's too arrogant to understand that she's kind of being facetious <laughs> and he's just like all right sweet arrogance is getting me late again love it and then like it's so gross when he's just like leans in before he leaves and he's just like i'm gonna put a prince in your belly i was like mm. like i was by myself watching this and i literally had my face scrunch up i was aware that i was like oh because <laughs> it's gross that guy's gross he's ridiculous so anyway I know everyone's hoping now that he gets his at some point during this season. Everyone's hoping for that. Um, mm, 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 mm. Yeah, and I just wrote down, like, can anyone stand Euron? Is there anyone who can really, like, stand Euron? I, I mean, I was going to say not viewer uh, viewers of the show-wise, but sure, viewers of the show-wise, can you stand Euron? But I was thinking, like, in the show, like, is there any character who meets this dude and is just like, I actually like this guy. No, I feel like everyone who is, like, cool with him is, they need something out of that relationship. Ugh. So, um, I do think that when when Theon eventually saved Yara, at, well, bailed her out, and she's talking to him about going back to the Iron Islands and saying, well, you know, Euron cannot protect this, so I want to go back and take it back, because screw that guy. Um... I think she makes a really good point when she says that, you know, we can be very helpful by taking the Iron Islands back because if 
Daenerys and everyone can't defeat the White Walkers, then they need a place to go where the White, Walker, walk, the White Walkers can't get. How about some islands in the middle of the ocean? And I, I was like, yeah, you know what? She, she does make a good point. But it seems that they're going to split at this point. Theon wants to go back. Um, as we can see, he's reached his turning point right now where he's going to become um, an honorable Theon. He, was, he will no longer be Reek. He will no longer be Reek, so that's coming. Um, just not not a huge thing, but just I loved the trio when they were talking together of Tyrion, Varys, and uh, Davos. First of all, I love all three of those characters quite a bit. Um, I will say that in the books that I've read, Davos is one of my favorite characters in that, as is Varys, those two. Tyrion's good in the books too, but I think he's better in the show. Uh, and I think that has a lot to do with what Peter Dinklage brings to that role. I think he does a really good job with it. So just those three talking, like it was great dialogue, all their personalities coming together. You're just like, I like all these people. They're really awesome. And they were really smart, like what they were talking about. They were very analytical. And I like that scene quite a bit. Um, <laughs> and then I wrote down when I was watching when um, Jon Snow and Daenerys were kissing, I was like, is anyone else getting that Luke Skywalker and Leia romance feeling right now? Where you're just like, oh, yeah, don't do it. No, please don't do it. And then I think the dragon, that one dragon kind of knew it too. Because when he's like kissing her and he looks and the dragon's like staring him down. I was like, Aah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think that's why the dragon's doing that kind of. is is I think that's a nod to the audience saying like, yeah, they're related, and this is gross right now. But I think everyone's kind of known that at this point. So, And I'll talk about the kind of reveal a little bit later, but there's not that much left to this video. So I'm trying to keep it as concise as I can with hitting everything. So um, uh, it seems that the issue with all the houses in the north having to do with Sansa, you know, a lot of them are saying like, well, we pledge to Jon Snow, and we will we'll follow Jon Snow, but we're not going to follow Sansa. It does seem to me to be um, sex-related, not like physical sex-related, but like that she's a, a woman. You know, it, it does seem to be that like the North is that old-timey, that they're kind of like, we don't, we're not going to follow a lady. We want to follow a king. We want to follow a man. But in the end... Jon Snow's not their person to follow. Yes. But we didn't know that right at that moment. Well, I mean, a lot of us probably kind of suspected it, but we didn't. it wasn't confirmed at that point when that's going on. Um, okay, so here we're getting to it. First of all, the Samwell uh, Tarly scene with Daenerys and uh, Jorah Mormont is kind of tough because like, you really feel for Samwell. I've had a problem throughout the series, and actually in the book too, of really feeling for Samuel Tarly because he really is an annoying character and has been a very annoying character. But I do feel, I do feel that uh, in like last season and then the beginning of this season, he's become way less annoying. He's actually kind of at a point where he's like not annoying to me anymore because he's becoming more normal. Because prior to that, he just like complained a lot and ran from everything, and it just. It felt like they hammered that home way too much. Like, they focused on his cowardice so much and it made it so overblown that I was just like, oh my god, here we go. Another scene with Samuel Tarley. What's he going to run away from right now? What's he going to complain about right now? So it, it's really nice to see him maturing, really. Like, becoming more of, like, his own person. And the scene where Daenerys lets him know that she killed his father and brother, which... I know his father was a total D-bag to him, but I think his brother wasn't bad. Like, his brother was decent to him, so that one would really hurt. But, I mean, regardless, it would hurt. But I feel like that was a good moment that kind of brings home that he's he's kind of unfettered right now. Like, he's he's free to be himself entirely because he doesn't have the judgments of his father, the judgments of his brother. Like, he's the only male figure in, in the immediate Tarly family left, I believe. And when he asks, asks for the pardon with the sword, like, he, in the end, doesn't even have to because that sword's his then. Because his father's dead, his brother's dead. So, 
Um, I just think really good scene there. Like I said, it was kind of hard to watch because you really feel for Sam. And then he goes outside and he sees Bran, who Bran's a whole nother thing for me, which um, I'll talk about in a minute because I don't want to break the flow of this. But, um, but you know, Sam goes out and t- talks to Bran and Bran's like, well, you know, you have to tell John now what's going on. And he's like, oh, God. Can you imagine being the person <laughs> having to deliver news like that? It's like, oh, so you know this woman you've been kissing, potentially sleeping with? You guys are related. And it's not like cousins or anything, or like second cousins, third cousins or anything. It's it's like, that's your sister. Sorry. Like, mm, there's, there are not enough baths or showers that will wash that off. I'm sorry. But just imagine being that person to deliver that news. Ugh. So he does. Sam does it. I, th- I think he does it kind of the best he can. And he's actually a little bit forceful with it. Like kind of saying, look, man, like I know this is crappy news and everything, but you need to start thinking about A, implications of what this information means. And B, what you you need to do for not, not just Winterfell, not just Daenerys, not just yourself, but for all of the kingdoms. And I think that that like that kind of does show a really good turning point for Samwell's character, where he's, you know, meeting conflict kind of head on because that's true. That truly is a very con- conflict driven thing to kind of bring up and talk about. You know, not only does he just say, "Hey, uh, by the way, you're potentially boning your sister. I think you need to not do that," but he says also you might want to consider like trying to be the king of all these kingdoms. It's that's tough. That's tough to bring up to someone, especially when you've been a coward for most of your life. So I feel like this is a really good turning point for Samwell's character. I dig it. I love it. Um, oh, FYI, we went to the part where uh, Beric Dondarrion and uh, Tormund Giantsbane are going through. I, I think that's a, that was like in the catacombs, like the the um, all the tunnels at the wall, and. Uh, at that point, I started thinking, FYI, I want to tell all you people, if you haven't read the books, at this point, at this stage in the story, Beric Dondarrion is long dead. Like, he has been dead for a long time. Uh, and he, um, yeah, he's been dead for a long time. Uh, but I guess they're keeping him around. I mean, and that's one of the reasons that uh, there was a point where I had been watching the show and then I stopped because some things started happening that didn't jive with the book very much. And I was like, Oh, I want to wait for the books. Uh, but now I don't even think that's happening, but I think I'm going to do a whole uh, video where I'm talking about my feelings on, uh, why I think George R. R. Martin will never finish those books because I don't think he will, but I'll, I'll do a different video for that. Um, yeah. So Beric is not around in the books. Not like that matters because they're doing their own thing on the show. Uh, he, I like that character in the books. He's one of my favorite characters, to be honest. He's awesome. Um, do, 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 do. uh, yeah. So I wrote down here, I, I'm kind of getting sick of Bran. I've been sick of Bran. Uh, I think he's just, I, well, first of all, I don't think his acting's all that great, to be honest. And the big, <laughs> the biggest thing that's hitting for me is that I feel like becoming the three eyed Raven was him being, becoming emo becoming this emo kid. He's just like, oh, oh, this, oh, that, oh, this is going on, all that. He's like the most annoying sage ever. <laughs> it's like, I don't know. Do other, do you people feel the same way about this? Like, put some comments down there. Like, how do you feel about the brand character? Like I said, I don't think the acting's very good. And I just, I think the, the way the character's written, he's just so like, blah. He's just he's he's like the old Samwell Tarly just complaining about things. It's just like I mean I understand like he has a lot to complain about in life, but I mean you don't need to put that in the show. I don't know. Might just be my thing. I think it is, but um, but at the end that that moment where we basically we come full circle and we go back in a, in a sense to season one where Jamie shows up in Winterfell and he sees Bran and just the eye contact there, you're just like. Oh, that's right. These two haven't seen each other since Jamie pushed Bran out of a window <laughs> and tried to kill him because he was boning his sister. It's like, woo. I just thought it was cool. Like, we're full circle now at the end of this episode. Like, we're back in season one, kind of. Uh, so, um, 
So then after the show, I was just like, man, you know, like so many people at the moment really want revenge. Like so many people. And it kind of points to a larger thing that I think, you know, this entire story, this entire series points to, which is um, human humanity gets in the way of itself, survival wise. And we're really, really seeing that in season one of, or uh, episode, I'm sorry, episode one of season eight of Game of Thrones, where they're really showing you like, hey, this is crunch time. This is like do or die time with the White Walkers coming. And you're either going to live or you're not going to live. And what makes sense is for everyone to legitimately come together and defeat this threat. But while everyone's saying, yeah, that's what we're going to do, you're seeing that everyone's plotting to, you know, sweep others legs from out from under them while this is going on which is putting this mission totally in danger like you literally could lose all of humanity just because you want power or just because you want revenge and i think this show is doing a really good job especially now of kind of pointing out how terrible humanity is and it really does kind of point to real life humanity in a sense where how many times have you seen like politically or in the news, other stories wise, where you're just like, man, what are people doing? Like they're looking out for only their own interests. Interests. They're only about power. They're only about revenge. And if you just come together, you could do so many good things for humanity as a whole. But you can't think outside your own little selfish bubble. And that's really what's going on in Game of Thrones. Is that. You know, maybe things will come together in the end. Maybe there will be, like, a nice story. But everyone knows how Game of Thrones is gone. And everything could be garbage in the end. Like, I saw someone who was talking on, on social media the other day, and they're like, is anyone else rooting for the Night King to, to take the Iron Throne? I think it, le it could happen. It legitimately could happen. Because George R.R. R. Martin, that's one of the main reasons. The way he writes, and we've all learned that. Season 1 set us up. We're like, clearly Ned Stark keeps his head. Nope. Nope. There it went. That's literally what it, what it was like. And we may get that moment at the end of season eight. But I'm fully interested. I'm in. So that being said, I'm going to do a star rating for each of these episodes uh, out of five. And I can do halves. And I'm just kind of comparing it to Game of Thrones episodes. Um, and a little bit just like overall TV shows. Um, so I would give this four out of five stars. I think you know that makes sense to me because it's the first episode of this new season so they kind of got to like get things working a little bit they can't just jump in and have everything be nuts and crazy that's gonna come later and we don't have to wait all that long because like i said it's only six episodes so um yeah so yeah four out of five stars for me anyway hopefully everyone enjoyed this please let me know if you did also what your feelings are on this. You know, what did you think of the first episode? What are some theories you have going forward? Uh, I'm not really going to talk about my theories right now, but if people really want it, I could do like a theory episode or something. Or um, not episode, <laughs> a theory video or something like that. But anyway, uh, put some comments down here. Let's talk about it. Please, please, please. It, it's very, very helpful. If you liked anything in this video, if you like any of the videos you've seen, and if you want to check out my other videos, please do. But if you liked anything, please hit that subscribe. Literally takes you a second. Super painless. It can mean a lot for my channel in the long run. I am looking to grow things, and I am looking to do a lot more like film stuff on this on this uh, channel. So thank you, everyone, for checking this out. Uh, may the old and new gods be with all of you. Uh, and we'll see what happens with episode two. Until next time, keep it brutal.